the book in question, um, Warrior Girls, I wrote, you know, a while ago at this point. Um, I've written another book since, but it remains deeply important to me because, among other things, I think it might be the only book I've written that will actually be, you know, it's not a manual, but, but a lot of people say, you know, thanks, you know, I, I read this, it, it helped educate me, it helped, um, uh, Either, either tell me you know, what to do or what not to do. What drew me to it was, first of all, that I love sports. And when I say sports, first of all, I spent a great deal of my life either playing sports, <coughs> writing about sports, thinking about sports, thinking about sports too much. Um, so it's been a big part of my life. And when I say sports, I don't mean you know, easy jogging. I don't mean swimming a few laps in a pool. I don't even mean going to the gym and working out really hard. Um, I mean competitive sports. You know, sports where you put yourself on the line and there's a winner and there's a loser and, it, and it's meaningful to us. And, you know, not for everybody, but for a lot of people, that's, that's part of who they are and I think it's it's bred into a lot of this, and it's and it's an important part of life for for many people. And I think for me that that was a big reason to write this book because you know sports is worth preserving. It's it's worth protecting. It's worth doing in such a way that we come out in one piece. Um, I live in the D.C. area, and there's one line in this book that over the years has resonated a little bit more for me. Uh, maybe because I'm in the epicenter of, of politics, but there's a line in the book that says that, that women's sports and, and all of the, the um, games from Title IX are the one social revolution that we all agree on. And we think about it, you know, think about all the things in this country that are new, and there's, 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 there's tremendous disagreement over everything. There are battles, I mean, we can't get together on anything. Women, you know, the, the girls, should play sports and play hard and sweat and you know crash into each other and all the things that, that we didn't used to want or expect or celebrate. You know, everybody, I don't want to say everybody, there are some, you know, there's some holdouts, you know, there are some sore heads over 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 wrestling or whatever it is, but but we agree. I mean, there's there are people who homeschool their children and you know, they, they're off, quite often, you know, very conservative Christians. They want their kids, for better or worse, on homeschool teams, which still blows me away that you can be in a, you know, the homeschool against the Villanova high school or whatever. Um, so we all, we all agree that, you know, where I live right now, there's an Orthodox Jewish community, a, a little enclave, and they have a swim team in the local league. If you want to swim then, uh, you swim on Sunday. Saturday. So, you know, everybody is, is, you know, for what was really a revolution. And I can make a case that sports are better for girls in lots of ways than they are for boys, or at least that girls get and young women get, you know, all of the good stuff and, and none of the bad stuff, or very little of the bad stuff socially. You know, when I was growing up, and uh, a long time ago, as we just learned. <laughs> um, I don't think I was that different than, than most boys then or, or most boys now. You know, sports for me, you know, immediately, I might have been six or seven years old, and, you know, there was glory, there was personal glory in sports. And it somehow came clear to me that, that if I excelled in some sport, that, you know, something to me and to me personally. So, you know, I'm sure you've seen people do this and maybe you've done it yourself. You know, you're in the driveway by yourself and you're, you're dribbling the ball and you're counting down the clock, 10, 9, 8, 7, and you shoot the ball and it goes through the hoop and you're all by yourself. And, then, and you're like, wow. <laughs> you know, and that's like, that's like a big part of sports for being a boy. I mean, you, 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 you want to be the center of things. And that's, I think, part of, of male sports. Uh, not for everybody, I'm generalizing, but I, I think for a lot of my gender. 
from doing this book and, and researching this book, but, but well before that from observing my own two daughters, one of them was a, an NCAA athlete. I don't think that's necessarily the way it goes for lots of girls. I don't think that they get into sports and say, like, me, me, me. I, I feel that there's a sense of, of team, there's a sense of community, there's a sense of responsibility to that team, and I think that's good, first of all. I think it's, I think it's, it's different. Um, the other thing is the girls don't suffer from a lot of the bad uh, social uh, stuff. I'm talking about Michael Vick. I shouldn't say suffer from it. They don't participate. They are not uh, <coughs> sort of acculturated through sports, through the entitlement sports, to do all this bad stuff. So Michael Vick, uh, Ben <coughs> Roethlisberger, um, you know, the, the, the syndrome or the epidemic of, of male sexual assault among college athletes. I mean, it's, it's, it's not disconnected from, from sports itself. I don't know if it's connected to dribbling the basketball in the driveway. I don't know exactly where it comes from, but I think that we can all see that this is, this is part of the male sports landscape. Uh, I work for the New York Times Magazine sort of my day job, and it's really a great job to tell the truth because I get to go places and I get to, to meet people. And I get to see things that I, that I couldn't or possibly do on my own. And before the last Olympics, before the London Olympics, uh, I spent a couple of weeks in South Africa with Oscar Pistorius, the Blade Runner. I don't know if everyone knows who Oscar Pistorius is. It, you know, the guy that run, he had no lower legs and qualified for the Olympics to, in the able-bodied Olympics, as he calls them. In the able-bodied Olympics, the run is a 400-meter runner. And Oscar was so cool. I mean, one of, the, one of the most amazing people I ever met, not just because of what he did, but, you know, he had real books on his shelves. Like, I walked around his house and he read, you know, biographies of Mandela and, you know, all kinds of other stuff. And he was a gentleman. And... You know, he thought he was my host, and which athletes in this country don't do. So, you know, drive me around, you know, when we were off, he would cook us lunch. I thought, this is a tremendous guy. I mean, just, just a, one of the great human beings I've ever met in sports. Well, you know, not long after the Olympics, he's accused of shooting his girlfriend, either in, in, uh, with malice, with intent, or... Um, through some reckless, but frankly unforgivable a accident. I'm not sure that the, that the accident part of it is all that much better. Well, you know, I don't know what Oscar did. Um, I don't know why he did it. But I, I would say that it's not disconnected from his status as a male sports superstar. I can't say exactly how it's connected, but that's who he is, and that's part of who he is, and this is... I don't think it's something he thought he could get away with, but, but somehow it's wrapped up in there. So women and girls get all the great things of sports. They get, they get the camaraderie, they get the exercise, they get the sense of competition. They don't do all this bad stuff. But they have these unacceptably high rates of injury. And that's you know generally what career girls is about. And when I say high rates, I don't mean just like, you know, here's where it is for for the guys and here's where it is for the women. It's it's not it's not really that. The most it's it's more like this in some cases. The sort of showstopper, you know, among injuries for women athletes, as many of you know, and some of you may know from personal um, experience, are ACL injuries. The ACL is this little tiny thing in the middle of the knee. That, that, you know, you can't see, you can't feel, you don't know it's there, but when it ruptures, you know, you've lost your stability with your knee, and it's a catastrophic injury um, with a really involved surgery. And there are lots of estimates as to how many more times or, or the rate of women's ACL injuries as opposed to men, and the way it's done is playing similar sports. So, you know, men's soccer versus women's soccer. So 
I don't know what estimate is right. Some say it's twice as high. Some say it's four times as high. Some say it's as much as eight times as high. If it was two times as high, that would be huge. I think it's much more than two times. I think it's probably closer than, than to the four to eight times. Um, I think some people, you know, still say, oh, you know, that can't be, you know, the, the studies, you know, take a shot at certain studies. While I was doing this book, half the point guards, half the women point guards in the Pac-10 lost their season to an ACL injury. Half. Uh, five to 10 or six to 12, whatever it was. I was following a women's, a, young, a girls soccer team in um, Florida, a very elite, high-end girls soccer team. Um, it was a club. But they were high school age. Most of them were 17 or 18. Um, of the 18 players on that team, eight of them had already had ACL uh, injuries and surgeries, and a couple of them more than more than once. So, for any doubters, you can't find the equivalent uh, on a men's team, and uh, including a men's football team. I think the injury is so common that it's. To use an academic term I probably have never used before, I think it's normalized. Is that an academic term? <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's it's people think it's just something I'm going to go through, and I might go through it again. And uh, I think that's first of all a really bad thing. The other thing that's normalized is the, is the severity of it. Um, I've wrote about a young woman who came back and played soccer after an ACL injury less than five months after that injury. I thought I wrote about situations in which it was common to come back six or seven months after the injury. And this is oftentimes girls themselves pushing their doctors, pushing their coaches, pushing their parents. Robert Griffin III, who is not only a great quarterback for the Washington Redskins, but an elite track athlete who uh, qualified for the for the 400 meter trials, Olympic trials in the U.S. as a high schooler. He came back from his ACL injury after eight months, and he clearly came back too soon because he's not very good right now. So, part of this sort of process of oh, it's just I don't think anybody who really has an ACL injury says it's just an ACL, but but you know pushing to come back is is itself catastrophic. This lead character. The person that opens up this book is a young woman named Amy Stead. And she was, uh, to use an old fashioned term, she was a tomboy from Western North Carolina, which is, you know, mountainous country. And, you know, she played tackle football with the boys. And, you know, when her parents took her for long car rides, they had to stop the car every 20 minutes just, just so she could run around. I mean, she was just a young woman, a girl who needed to move. And she became a soccer star, um, playing for no kind of club, by the way. Playing, you know, it's being discovered playing recreational soccer. She was very, you know, late to, to, to step up to elite soccer. But she was, I don't know if I believe in naturals, but she was just, you know, just close to that. She became captain of the United States uh, under 19 team when she was just 16 years old. So she was amazing. And, you know, I don't, I don't know if she was going to be uh, the next Mia Hamm because she was a defensive player, but she was on that level. She was going to be the U.S. star. And I found out a little about Amy. And uh, she, she had gone to the University of North Carolina where she was a big recruit of Anson Dorrance's, who was probably the most famous women's coach. Amy was going to be one of Anson's stars. Well, by the time I met Amy, she was just about 22 years old. And I sat and I waited for her. Uh, I was sitting in an alcove at the Dean Smith Center, which is the big basketball arena, where, where we agreed to meet. And I knew her story. But I saw her walking up to me uh, from a distance. And if I didn't know that, that she had been an elite athlete, I wouldn't have thought that she was any kind of athlete at all because at 22 years old, 
she walked like like an elderly person. She really walked like like an old woman. And she told me her story. Um, she had had three ACL reconstructions, all in the same room. Um, she had had all these other surgeries, which because she had a certain mindset, she didn't even, she didn't even consider them surgeries. She just said, "Oh, they cleaned my knee out, or they, you know, it was a little meniscus they clipped, or whatever." So she couldn't really count all her surgeries. Her mother kept good count, and her mother said she had eight surgeries. And she told me about her last surgery, and um, she said that when she came out of anesthesia, you know, she sort of looked up and she saw the doctor, the doctor she knew well at this point. And the doctor just said, there, any, there, was, there was nothing in there left to fix. There was nothing in me left to fix. So I just basically, closed it up, and I, I don't think he said, you're done, but she was certainly done playing competitive soccer, and at that point, you know, she she was out in trouble just moving around. Her boyfriend was supposed to pick her up that afternoon, and he got tied up with something, and she asked me to give her a ride home, uh, which was maybe at most a half mile up a little hill, and Amy couldn't, couldn't comfortably walk up uh, and not because she was just out of surgery. I mean, this is like this is like months after her surgery, probably nine months after her last surgery. So that's a catastrophic, sad, tragic story. And Amy, you know, pushed back from every single surgery she had and wanted to get back on the field and wouldn't wait and just kept on going. And I don't know if it would have been any different if she had done it differently. I think it would have been. She certainly feels that way. But when I say that this is a particularly sad case, it's not a singular case, because I wrote this, this book came out in 2008, I believe, 2009, and I get emails once every couple of weeks, sometimes more than that. I get them through my website, and women say to me, uh, the words are usually something like, I am Amy Stedman, and then they begin telling me their Amy Stedman-like story. So, it's, I think to me it points out what an urgent issue this is. I mean, that's, that's the only way I can say it. There's, there's some science in my book, and I'm going to leave that to, to people who know the science better than me in more detail. The shorthand, as I think I understand it, is, uh, first of all, nobody knows for sure why ACLs um, rupture. Nobody knows for sure how to prevent it, but I think we have some pretty good ideas on both. The first thing that I would say about women versus men is there's something really unfair that happens. Um, when, when a guy goes through puberty, you know, he can sit on the couch, he can eat candy, he can never move, he can watch TV, and you know, through the influence of testosterone, he actually gets more muscle. You know, he gets stronger. Um, and that's just the way things are. Uh, women do not get appreciably stronger without working at it. They get more flexible, um, but they don't, they don't necessarily get that much stronger on their own. They have to work to get stronger. So the combination of more flexibility and not enough muscle around the joints is, is part of what is probably causing some of these injuries. The other thing that causes ACL injuries, and the thing that can be addressed in addition to, to strength training, is that girls run and land and decelerate differently than boys. Uh, or at least they tend to do that. They don't always, they're not always as natural as what's you know, sometimes called the athletic position. That can be modified. You know, it can be changed. It's very impolitic to say, but these training programs teach girls and young women to, to run more like boys. And I think that, that some of you have probably, I hope that some of you have gone, gone through that kind of training. Um, the research is not as strong on, on some other injuries, um, but my observation and talking to, to athletic trainers and talking to injury epidemiologists I think the feeling is that girls 
who do play sports, you know, tend to be hurting sometimes from head to toe. You know, ankles, knees, hips, backs, shoulders. And one of the things that I fear is that this starts from such a young age that I think that too many young women think that this is what it's like to play sports. This is the normal thing of playing sports. I'm just going to hurt all the time. And I think, uh, and I'm not an athletic trainer, I'm not a doctor, but I, I think that the research is going in the direction that some of the biomechanical um, and strength training that can go on would also address, you know, the back and the hips and, and these other things. There's one other factor to keep in mind. I think this is a huge factor. Girls may be tougher, you know, less wussy on the field of play. And in doing, in doing this book, I came across, you know, when you're a writer, and uh, it's not an exciting thing to do most of the time, because I sit in an office with my dog and I write, or I read through stuff, sometimes I get to travel, but every once in a while you come across something, you know, wow, you just like want to jump up and down or call your wife or tell your dog or, or something. <laughs> so I came across this research, and decades of research from the U.S. military, uh, the Army specifically, about basic training. Um, and going back to when women started doing basic training and doing the same things in basic training that the guys did, including, you know, carrying heavy weight, heavy weight and all that. And what they found was that women are much more often injured than men. They, they stress fractures are big in basic training because they're carrying a lot of weight. So women are more injured. So, you know, gender in the military is a really sensitive topic as it is in all of society. So this is not something that the military you know, puts press releases out of that. But the more interesting thing to me, or the as interesting thing to me in that research is that women um, don't want to leave the military when they're injured. It takes a really big injury to get a woman to say, I want to get out of here. The guys, you know, something hurts or, or a few things hurt, they, they want to go. So this sort of dovetails with what I've been told by lots of athletic trainers, uh, including one at St. Thomas Aquinas in Florida, which is like a big sports factory. It's like to you know, high school sports, what Notre Dame used to be to, to college football, or what Stanford is now to all sports. You know, they produce NFL players, they produce all these you know, NBA players. And the athletic trainer there told me, I can get, when I tell a football player, um, to get off the field, you got you got to sit out for a week, two weeks. You know, usually they, they groan, but it's fine. The girls, I can't get off the field. They say, take me up, put me back out there. And I don't know if that's because of sense of community, sense of responsibility of the team. I think part of it is that, but I also think a big part of it is, you know, that some of these girls may just have been hurting, you know, for too long and and all the time, and. You know, don't, as it's sometimes said, distinguish between injury and just, you know, being, being hurt a little bit, feeling sore. So, what I'm talking about here, and, you know, across the board are gender differences. And when this book came out, uh, I think it got a very good reception. But it did not get a good reception at all from the Tucker Center for the study of girls and women in sports. I don't think I have, it's a long title, but that's very close to the title. They, the Tucker Center has done great work for a couple of decades in uh, advocating for women in sports, advocate, advocating for girls, making sure that Title IX is, is fairly instituted. But, you know, they jumped all over this book and they, they talked about my, my purported facts, and they, they, they put up a, something called a scholarly blog, which I thought was a funny term to begin with. Um, and I understand, I completely understand why the subject wouldn't be sort of welcome to a lot of people. Uh, because when we talk about gender differences, you know, through history, that it usually meant gender inferiority, and, and women have gotten the worst part of that you know, consistently. You know, there was a time when women uh, thought they, they shouldn't ride bicycles, you know, workplace discrimination. You know, discrimination 
all across the board has been, you know, by talking about gender differences. And, um, but I think that in this case, I think that's, that's a really bad thing to sort of hear this as, as something that, that, that shouldn't be talked about. Because I do think, as I said, that it's, that it's a pretty urgent situation. And if anyone who sort of talks about greater injury rates is, is thought to be against Title IX, or is thought to be saying that women are the weaker sex, I don't think we're going to solve this, this injury problem. So there's the sort of physiological part of, of this, which, which can be addressed through training. But then there's the way we play sports in this country, which again, I think a lot of you have probably experienced firsthand. So if you wanted to manufacture injuries, if you wanted to cause injuries, what you would do is pretty much what we do. You would take a young athlete, and you would say, well, you're pretty good at this sport. Let's play this sport all the time. Let's play it to the exclusion of all other sports. Um, let's send you to these tournaments where you play five full-length games in three days. And, uh, and if the goal is to create a bunch of broken up kids, both, men, both, both boys and girls, that's pretty much exactly what you would do. When I went uh, before the Olympics, um, no, before the last World Cup, the New York Times Magazine asked me, basically, basically why do we not create great soccer players in this country? You know, why do we not really compete for World Cups as well-fed, as athletic, as big as this country is? You know, why do we stink? So it's a great assignment because I can just sort of like figure out, well, let's try, to, let's try to make that into a magazine story. And I went to the Netherlands uh, and spent a few weeks at Ajax, A-J-A-X, but it's pronounced Ajax, which is, you know, maybe the best soccer training grounds anywhere in the world. The Netherlands, uh, Holland, is a tiny country. They produce, you know, all these great players in the English Premier League. They, they produced you know, World Cup contending teams. So I went to Ajax and saw what they did. So this is what Ajax does. They uh, take young kids, they identify great young players, and they bring them to practice. If they're eight or nine or 10 years old, they pre maybe practice twice a week. Um, and then they, they take <laughs> physical training really seriously. So they're without a ball lots of times. Um, they do gymnastics. You know, they're, they're on the rings. They're doing all, all this stuff, all this very scientific seeming stuff sometimes. They care about how fast you run, but they only care about it in the first 10 meters. Because in soccer, you know, that's most of the burst of activity. So they do all this scientific stuff, but they also do like really common sense stuff. So they only practice, you know, twice a week with the young kids. And then they expect them to go play on the streets or go play in the park. And then they have to come back and tell them about the game of the park, because that's, that's part of their creativity. They think, they think what we do here is insane. And the rest of the world thinks what we do here is insane. And it is insane. You know, that's the sort of long and the short of it. And, you know, there are studies that, that we can look at that, that sort of give us Thinks about that and, and ways we might, might, might change. Um, one study that I, that I was looking at uh, just in the last couple of days talked about the rates of injury between games and practice. So for boys are injured 3.9 times as much in games, at 3.9, yes, 3.9 times more in games than they are in practices. Girls, it's 4.6 times. So there's an easy fix. Don't play as many games. You know, just don't play as many games. We, you know, a young, uh, a mid-teen in this country who's playing high school, club, some kind of, uh, I guess ODP still 
still exists for girls, but not for boys. But if you, you know, you can be on a third team. You might play 150 games a year. You know, that's that's just injury creation. It doesn't do anything, you know, for us as athletes. Um, twice as many injuries across all sports. Twice as many injuries occur in the second half of games. Okay, so we can't just play one half. But the reality is that if you're playing three games or four games or five games in a weekend tournament, by the third game, you feel like you're in the second half and your body is broken down and your biomechanics are broken down. So this is, you know, this is what, what we do. So the first obvious thing we can do is bond together, you know, as young athletes. And a lot of you guys are going to be parents. And if you're athletes now, the great likelihood is that you're going to be parents of athletes. And just say, no. You know, you just say, you know, go to your coaches and, and go to your your fellow parents or if you're if you're still athletically involved, you know, wherever you're confident, say this this doesn't work. I mean if you're a college athlete, you know, you obviously just can't say no. Um, but I also think <laughs> but I also think that, that college athletics are are different, you know, because some of you guys have been given scholarships and uh, People have a greater degree of, of care because they've made an investment in you, and I don't think you're playing five games in, in three days. Um, so partly the, the issue is, you know, at, at younger ages. And the other is all of the biomechanical retraining that we can do. Um, and I think, again, that happens a lot in colleges, but it has to happen at younger levels. You know, when you teach a young athlete to move differently at 20 years old or even 18 years old, that's a lot more difficult than trying to teach it when, when somebody is five or six or seven or eight. So that is my presentation uh, for now. And I think we're going to have a, a panel uh, of some sort here and, and maybe learn a little bit more about the, the medical aspects of it. And,
it's working really well at Villanova. And I'll kind of touch on that at the end of where we're going with it. Um, so yes, women get hurt in sports far more frequently than men. More importantly, women typically get the non-contact, I blew out my ACL, run down the field, boom. Men, especially you see the sport that kind of rivals soccer and rivals any women's sport is football. Football gets injured all the time. It's contact, it's collision. That's how those guys tear their ACLs. Most of our women tear their ACLs just running or just coming down from a rebound or planting and cutting and then they crumble to the ground. So that's a problem. Women are getting hurt and women are tearing their ACLs all by their lonesome. No one's helping them, no one's pushing them. They're basically just crumbling to the ground with no contact with another player. Why does it happen? We know women and men are built very differently. You can look at a female next to a male and see certain things that are very different. Once we all hit puberty, things change. Boys get more testosterone like Mike said. Women get more estrogen. Women's hips widen, so we get this thing called the Q angle. So we are supposed to bear children and do all these wonderful things. So our hips go this way, and then our knees are this way. So it creates this kind of unnatural angle from where your hips sit in relation to where your knees sit. So guys sit nice and upright like this, girls sit like this. So that, that's a big difference. Um, I'm also a big believer in men just naturally move better than women do. It's an evolution, as it was it for all the years where women were baking pie and taking care of the children and sweeping the floors and the men were out working and earning the money. And so men have been physically active for far more greater years than women have. Title IX happened in 1972. So think of all those years where men were playing sports and we were sweeping floors. It, it makes a big difference. Just like we see athletes get more skilled and more efficient in their moves over years, as a culture, as a species, women have kind of tried to play catch up. We're doing a great job, but we're still not moving as efficiently as the men do. So the way that I look at it is we can't change our anatomy, we can't change our hips, we can't change our hormones, but what we can do is change our biomechanics or change our neuromuscular factors. I can get stronger. I can move more efficiently, even if I have hips. And that's where the focus of injury prevention comes in. Um, the biggest thing that we see are women's mechanics, especially in their deceleration. 90% of all injuries, both male and female, happen in what we call the eccentric phase, so the slowing down. Rarely do athletes get hurt pushing off into the sprint. They get hurt breaking down the sprint. Rarely do athletes get hurt jumping. They get hurt landing. So 90% of all of our injuries happen in that phase. So we know that. So we know we have to fix that. Women, if you go to any, let's say, if you go to any soccer game or basketball game, there's going to be one thing that you see. Girls' knees go, and that is how the ACL tears. So they're not strong enough to overcome the forces and their knees go, basically we call it knocking, they land and whoop, their knees go in and then they pop them back out. That is how most ACLs are torn. So what can we do to teach women not to do that? One of the big things I'm a proponent of is red flagging athletes. I can go into a basketball game, I can go into a soccer game and I can watch someone move. All I have to do is watch them play for five minutes and you can know right away who's going to be more predisposed to injury. So we need to get the right people out there to red flag the athletes. We can also do things such as there's a big movement towards functional movement screening in the last couple of years where we put the athlete through a series of six tests. We watch them move. They're simple things. They're lunges. They're squats. And we can basically assess how strong or how weak they are in certain areas. That is another red flag. What we need to do from there is we take that red flag athlete and then we need to modify their training. Then we need to say, no, 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 you can't go in the weight room and squat 200 pounds. 
you need to do body weight squats and move correctly before you get stronger. I always talk about what is the point of building a house on a weak foundation? It's going to crumble. With our athletes, we like to build a really strong foundation. I want them to be able to move their body perfectly, with no knees going in, with no knees going over the toes, before I even do any strength work with them. That is key. You cannot build a house on a weak foundation. The problem is coaches want results, coaches want bigger, faster, stronger. Parents want results, bigger, faster, stronger. So it's got to be a big cultural push to understand the importance of doing the little things before we do the big dynamic things. And for the coaches, it's a hard sell. For the parents, it's even a hard sell. Until that athlete blows out their ACL. And as soon as they do, they understand. I have seen my fair share of ACLs. I can't even count on how many I have rehabilitated in my seven years at Villanova. And I will tell you that every single one of my athletes who have torn their ACL and is back on the playing field moves better, is stronger, and is faster. Because I had six months of one-on-one -on -one time with them every single day to teach them how to move correctly. And then I put them in the weight room. And then they get stronger. So it, it's kind of you know, it's a catch-22. You get hurt, hey, you'll get better in the long run. But it is you know six months of a very, very grueling, grueling, daunting rehabilitation. The early intervention, I'm, I'm blessed enough to work with Division I athletes. So most of them are very athletic. Most of them still can't move correctly as females. So we have to get these interventions earlier to the it's much easier to learn how to move correctly at a young age. Because once an athlete has a movement pattern, trying to get them to change it, especially once they're here at the Division I level, is a very, very <coughs> difficult task and a very daunting task. Because athletes have this, well, if it's not broke, why fix it? I'm doing great. I'm doing this great. Until something goes wrong. So we need to reach these kids at an earlier age. Um, so where are we going with that? I believe that in the next five to ten years, and I should say I hope, that we're going to see more injury prevention specialists. I think it's probably going to start at the pro level, at the Division One level. But I think that we need to create more people who are knowledgeable about this and know how to, number one, red flag that athlete, and number two, correct their movements. And we need doctors that will say, hey, all right, so this kid's got mad knee injury, refers them to this injury prevention specialist, and this injury prevention specialist can take them through those exercises. We have made great strides in the last few years of incorporating injury prevention programs with teams. So club teams have little warm-ups that they do and things like that. That's great, but the problem is the person delivering this program probably doesn't have the knowledge. Okay, you tell that girl, no, your knee doesn't go in, no, your knee doesn't go in. What does she have to get stronger so the knee doesn't go in? We have the same problem in Division I athletics. If you have a strength conditioning coach that knows that you shouldn't do that but doesn't understand how to correct it, again, we're going to constantly tell that athlete don't do that, but we have to fix the lack of musculature that women have, the lack of core, the lack of posterior chain. So basically, lack of stomach muscles, lack of butt muscles, and lack of ability to use them. We have to fix that from the ground up starting at a younger age. So hopefully in the next 10, 15 years, that's what we're going to see. Um, more injury prevention specialists, more people who make it their mission and make it their passion to help prevent these injuries. Physicians might not like it. They make a lot of money off of all these ACL tears. But that is where I believe the profession will be going because we know how to fix ACL tears. Um, doctors have perfected their sort of technique. It's an art form. But regardless of how good the surgery is, it's still six months of an athlete's life. And then there's the, well, what if it happens again? And then there's the, I have torn my ACL four times, and now I have to stop playing, and I have a risk for osteoarthritis and a knee replacement by the time I'm 35. So we basically need to stop being reactive, and we need to be more proactive. And that's as a sports medicine profession, that's as parents, that's as coaches. Is, is butt muscle the actual 
sports, be it adult sports or youth sports, means talking about men or boys. This is not part of some misogynistic conspiracy, but simply reflects a dominant ideology that's steeped in patriarchy. What I'd like to propose, following from Michael and Stacey's remarks, is that the increased opportunities afforded to girls playing sports has a seeming underbelly, that there are unintended latent consequences of girls' and women's sports equality. These unintended consequences may appear as increased ACL injuries, increased concussions, increased athlete burnout, increased cheating, and a decrease in sports participation as an end in itself. These unintended consequences may express themselves first in players and families who pour extraordinary amounts of physical, emotional, and financial resources into youth sports, uh, second in an exploding athletic industrial complex around youth sports looking to sell apparel, showcase tournaments, personal coaches, premier travel teams, specialty camps, and nuclear power footwear. Uh, third, in a non-stop media barrage, constantly highlighting certain ways of playing certain sports. Fourth, and maybe most importantly, in educational institutions that reify and legitimate sports as a crucial social activity. Remember, nowhere else in the world is organized sports so intertwined with organized education. <coughs> This is apparent in a mixed gender middle and high school setting where sports is almost always the center of student culture, male sports. Uh, there are no pep rallies or poster contests for the girls' field hockey team. And there are no pep rallies or poster contests around Kennedy High School's model UN rivalry with Eisenhower High. In fact, there's no rivalry around, around the model UN. So beyond high school, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Beyond high school, though, it seems to me that intercollegiate sports is the single most important educational parlor with the unintended negative consequences of girls' youth sports. College admissions and college scholarships are the holy grail, fueling the growing insanity and intensity of youth sports families, and giving rise to all these ancillary elements of the athletic industrial complex. If you want your daughter to get into a good school, or any school if she's not that smart, <laughs> And you want to save millions of dollars in tuition costs because of the overpriced professors. Then all you need to do is buy the state-of-the-art product, join these 11 travel teams, and attend that expensive summer camp run by the former third-string goalie of What's the Matter You. But the existence of athletic scholarships or preferential admissions is not some pre-existing social condition. It's not, it has not evolved through some uh, natural selection. Colleges and universities have made decisions to subsidize the existence of and participation in certain organized sports. And there are a couple of issues I want to raise here. First, at its most philosophical level, why do universities do this? What makes the existence of and participation in an intercollegiate lacrosse team, for example, not the female one, what makes that more important than the existence of and participation in an all women's distaff choir? Why are we willing to subsidize financially or through relaxed admission standards? Those who play soccer rather than those who play the trumpet. Secondly, I believe there's a lack of candor about the likelihood of receiving a college scholarship, a misperception partly encouraged by the universities themselves. It is not a well-known fact that only 11% of all Division I and Division II college athletes receive full athletic scholarships. And that percentage would probably be cut in half if we omitted basketball and football from why isn't this a well-known fact? It sure intrigues people when we bring it up in class. And how does the not well-knownness of this fact fuel the insanity of girls' youth sports and thus the cataclysmic rise in young girls' sports injuries, not to mention the non-cataclysmic rise of boys' sports injuries and football players with permanent brain damage? This is our fault, right here. It's Villanova's fault, and it's the fault of other colleges and universities have exaggerated the importance of sports within our society by privileging it as an activity worthy of significant financial and cultural rewards. 
why not call scholarships to those who are willing to join Habitat for Humanity rather than those who join field hockey? Now, pointing out these latent negative consequences does not make Michael or Stacy the bride, pigs against gender equality. In fact, I would argue it's just the opposite. We're trying to highlight that the changes in female sports are being driven by a very male-centered model about what kinds of human activity are going to be valued. This is something we talked about in the book as well, in some of the later chapters. The fact that we judge the values of sports by strength, size, speed, and jumping high is not a given. It is a social construction. We don't have to judge basketball prowess by slam dunks, but we choose to. We could judge basketball prowess by the number of passes a team makes before shooting or by how much its defense irritates the other team. You may think that's ludicrous, but it was the standard measuring stick when I was growing up, when Michael was growing up. That's only a generation ago. Or maybe a generation and a half. <laughs> <laughs> now just look at how women's gymnastics and women's figure skating has changed to value strength and jumping rather than grace and nuance. This was not some sort of warp speed Darwinian evolution, but the result of conscious choices made by influential people and organizations who quite possibly were concerned with reducing gender inequality and making women and men more alike in terms of how they express themselves in sports. The point is that sports equality always uses the male-centered model as the standard and never a female-centered model. Sports equality seemingly does not entail having men and boys adopt a female-centered way of doing activities. Isn't the essence of the game, though, the same either way? Think about lacrosse different men's lacrosse is and women's lacrosse. Because women don't get to hit each other. And that's seen by a lot of women who I talk to who play lacrosse as a bad thing. They want to be like the boys. They want to hit. But why don't the boys want to be like the girls and not hit? And just throw a little ball back and forth, a little basket. That's fun. But that's not the model that we work for. It's always that we have to adopt the male model or the male the male way of doing a certain sport rather than a female. If Michael is correct and Stacy is correct, the females and males have physiological differences without implying that these differences are better or worse, then we're putting the health of our daughters in great jeopardy by always adopting a male-centered standard for equal opportunity. That's just not fair, and it's very dangerous. So, can I pick, can I pick up on two things you said real fast? First of all, you know, the difference in style is uh, really interesting. John Wooden, the greatest college basketball coach ever from UCLA, near the end of his life, he said that he liked the women's game better. It was more like the game he grew up with. It was more, uh, it was more about passing, more about cutting, more about teamwork, less about uh, force. Now, I will say, when I watch the women's game now, it has become less that way. The women's game is faster. It's not as, it's not as precise. Um, without being sexist, I don't like it as much. I, I agree with John Wooden. That's not because girls can't uh, do those things, although certainly there's not as much dunking, there's not as much size. It's not even that they can't. I just like the other style of basketball better, the same way I like watching the San Antonio Spurs play, play that same style. Now, going back to something you said in the beginning, and I suspect this is probably in, in the book you're writing, you guys play, whether you play softball, soccer, lacrosse, whatever you play, you play tournaments <clears throat> somewhere um, at these giant complexes. You know, there were like 97 fields. And you went out uh, to lunch or, and dinner, and your family came, and you stayed at hotels and all the stuff. Your family dropped a bunch of money. These things are all, or almost all, built with public money. And the promise is that you build this, and if you own the Wendy's or you own the hotel, you know, it's going to be good for everybody. That's a really hard thing to unwind um, because it's really bad for, for, the, for the child athlete because you don't need to play five games in a weekend. You don't need to play a tournament every, every month or two times a month. You don't need to do any of that stuff. But these locales, and based on the tax money, based on the capitalism, that's what you got to do. So I don't know how, that's a good point you raised. I don't know how you unwind all of that because that's a huge factor. Some huge 
But they can see them in fewer corners. Now that we're here, you will never go back. Ever. Well, well, which is why I'm pointing to the included athletics in the middle of the driving force behind all that stuff. <laughs> <laughs> to somehow get the coaches to stop using the showcase corners right. as they recruit. Because when you get coaches in soccer, which I know, to stop recruiting from travel teams and instead recruit from high schools the way they used to, a lot of this stuff would wither away. Or of course, <laughs> make the rules. I mean, really good college coaches. I don't think want kids to play five games or four games in a weekend. If if they set the rules and said, here's where we'll recruit, because they don't want these girls kind of all broken up, right? See, that's difficult to say because recently NCAA has passed a lovely new rule. So for those of you that are unfamiliar with sports seasons. Men's and women's basketball have the longest season behind the game of ice hockey. So a typical men's or women's basketball season will last six months. Six months. That is a very big chunk of time. NCAA recently passed that, you know what, you're allowed to practice from June and July now. So now our basketball team, across the NCAA, get off the month of May and three weeks of the month of August. That is seven weeks out of the entire year that a sports team is not allowed to train. So now, so at least the kids now kind of know what they're getting into. This year I had two high school freshmen, or two uh, freshmen on the team that hadn't graduated high school yet and were practicing with us. All because the NCAA says, yes you can. So these kids are playing five games in a weekend and this and that, but at least they're kind of learning what they're getting into. Yes, but don't you as an athletic trainer, don't you see a lot of the injuries coming out of that specific setting? Maybe not. That's my impression. I see the majority of the injuries happening once you specialize. Because, oh, my kid's good at basketball. Play basketball. Oh, no, 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 you can't play softball. No, 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 you can't play soccer. It's specialization. Uh, Dr. James Andrews, who is one of the most well-known orthopedic surgeons in our country and all over the world. I'm sure you've heard his name being thrown around in NFL games and baseball games that you're watching. He started this new program to, to try to break away from that specialization because we're really doing our children an injustice by letting them just play one sport because they're only strengthening one group of muscles and they're only learning one skill set and they're only moving in whatever that sport entails that they move. Um, so, this kind of goes along with the special, specialization part. Um, I have read your book, and obviously you talked a lot about that. And so, when I went home, I played soccer like my whole life. Um, and um, when I went home, my sister is 10 years old, and the only sport she's played so far is soccer. And when I was younger, I played basketball. I swam. I did all the different things. And um, so, I told my parents, I was like, well, why not you like, get her into other sports because we talked about this in class and um, they were wondering and I guess they kind of wondered too like yeah you can get involved in different sports for them like burn out from one sport but will it really deal with the issue of overuse because like some sports like soccer and basketball I mean you're using some of the same muscles and so is it like really going to help? In one respect yes uh, because different sports are going to train the muscles differently. So an ACL injury, some of you know, is not an overuse injury. The amount of overuse injuries that women incur, unless they're cross-country runners, are far less than the over or than the acute traumatic ACL tears. So yes, I think it should be encouraged. Um, like I said, overuse injuries aren't a problem right now. It's concussions and ACLs. You guys know that. So yes, I think that we should encourage that. Now, should we push it? You know, it's how the, the athlete, it's how the child feels, but the more dynamic training that they get, the better off they'll be. Can I ask you a question? Uh, don't some people, though, believe that the, the acute injuries, the traumatic injuries, they're not overuse injuries, but if you're tired, if your mechanics break down, uh, if, that that's a factor. I know that's harder to research. Yes, but like in your book, it was called an overexposure injury, yeah. which is, is 
very true. Um, one of the things we see, if you were talking about some of the statistics of women and gains and injuries actually occur, believe it or not, more injuries actually occur in practice, especially at the division level. Because how many times a week do we practice versus how many times a week do we play? So we're seeing a lot of that. Um, anytime you get fatigued, so, one of, with all my ACL rehabs, one thing that I do is fatigue them, I fatigue them, I fatigue them, and then they have to perform the exercises correctly. A proper training program works on strengthening your core musculature. So your hips, your abs, your gluteus maximus, medius, piriformis, all of the muscles that basically support your trunk. Because even if our legs are tired, our core can fire and keep the muscles from fatiguing and the knees going in. So that is a big factor. We do have to train the muscles that aren't kicking the ball and sprinting down the field to be strong all the time. So we can hopefully prevent the fatigue causing the knees. No. So if that child starts at an early age playing the same sport and incurring the same damage to the knees and the same damage to this and that, then yes. But there is no correlation as of now that I'm aware of. Um, I've been playing soccer since I was five and this happened. It's more so what happens in the timetable of that athlete's life. So for example, athlete tears one ACL, they're very likely to either tear the other one or re-tear that one. So say that athlete tears their ACL when they're 14, and then they go on to have a great collegiate career. The likelihood of them between the ages of 18 and 23 when they're done playing of re-tearing or tearing the other ACL is very high. I think, I think one reason for that is with all the study and with all the suspicions, predispositions for tearing an ACL are not 100% known. So, you know, especially among girls, like you can look in, at others that told me, how it's told me, you know, a trained eye can look and say, you are not moving correctly, but still, the person who tore it has that disposition. There's something about their biomechanics or something about their body chemistry, whatever it is, they just prove that they're a person who will tear an ACL, and until we figure out how to prevent it, they're a little more likely to do it again. So with that being said, um, I wanted to touch on this in my sphere. I think one of the injustices that we do to our young athletes, so our athletes that tear their ACL that are either in middle school, high school, or not at the collegiate level, so anyone that's basically below a, a college athlete, they tear their ACL, they go to their doctor and they get it fixed. Well, then they have to go to physical therapy in order to rehabilitate the knee. Like I said earlier, you can fix that knee, but until you get stronger, you're never going to be able to play the same again. Unfortunately, most medical coverage, most insurance plans say you can only do three rehab sessions per week and you only get 30 of those. So by the time that athlete is three months out, they're 30 or up. So unless mom and dad have the amount of money to pay a physical therapist, which is usually about $250 per session out of pocket, they kind of do things on their own. So the most important part of their training should be that functional, that begin to get back into their sport training. And now no, because that's the health care. And, and, and that's because they only have three sessions per week and 30 of them to do that 30 year on their own. And that's another reason why these young kids are predisposed to doing it again or re-tearing the same knee. One well, of the other parts about specialization is so interesting beyond the, the physical component of, of getting hurt is, is the kind of emotional, emotional baggage of, of learning to dislike something that you love so much. And perhaps maybe be able to early 
start, maybe the more likely you are to, to stop liking something sooner rather than later. But I, don't, I can't tell you how many college athletes I've known through the years who tell me they can't wait to stop playing. Is that the softball team? Yeah? <laughs> Water polo team. Water polo team? Very little cats. <laughs> Uh, I wasn't prepared to say anything about water polo. <laughs> but, but how many, I mean, there are people in this room probably who are varsity athletes who cannot wait until their careers are over, who will have ended their careers prematurely because they just didn't enjoy it anymore. And the idea of forcing yourself to go through what you have to go through as a varsity athlete, if you don't like it, and doing it just for the money, and then you like the rest of us who work. <laughs> we show up at work because we have to, not necessarily because we want to. Just thinking about coaching sports, I've played sports for my whole life, and I've never not loved what I was doing. And the idea of not loving this stuff, it just, I can't imagine what it's like. Do any of you feel that way? I, I know a couple of you do, I'm not going to call you out. So, do, do any of you I don't know feel that way? Blah, 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 blah. <laughs> <laughs> that was my water pool. <laughs> now, we've all, you. Your face won't be on the camp, so the coaches won't know. <laughs> uh, Close your eyes. What's this world? Maybe how about just people that you know? It's not you. It's never you. It's always a friend of yours, right? A friend of mine's breaking up with their boyfriend. Right? So, oh, but you got any stories about people who stop enjoying this this thing that should be just enjoy? Well, I've been swimming since I was seven before I started playing water polo. Swimming, swimming. And, um... Yes, and since I was like 11 or 12, my club coach was just trying to train me to go to nationals. Like, I was like on track, and I just like started hating it like junior and senior year, and I just stopped so bad for a lot of Obviously, it didn't work out. I'm not going to college, but. Yeah. You enjoy water polo? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Once in a while, I can go the other way. My daughter, my daughter was a swimmer and then a college swimmer. And uh, as you well know, a mid-teen female swimmer is not usually that happy as a human being. Your hair smells like chlorine. Your skin is awful. You're getting up at 5:45 in the morning. It's a hard life. And she hurt her shoulder uh, uh, junior year. And you know, she spent a few weeks like doing all the bad things that she didn't do when she was. Uh, and then I just remember her, you know, sitting on the bed crying, saying, "I miss swimming. I miss swimming." And at that moment, she did, and she loved it more. So, you know, I just think every once in a while, it's like you, you lose something and you, you realize it. She may not have liked the bad thing she was doing there. That could be. <laughs> <laughs>
Yasmin, who went to the um, went to burnout and Athens and Zinc, uh, I also did a little bit on the athletic training with track and cross country. And I had an athlete who, great athlete, Division One, until a champion multiple times in her college career, ended up with a, a, a significant injury, a cable tear. Same thing, missed it so much, wanted to come back, they're really grueling. Um, we have sessions every day with an athletic trainer, a physical therapist. Missed it, loved it, couldn't wait to get back. By the time her fifth year rolled around, she was done. Same thing, couldn't wait to get out of it. You know, still loved running, but just by, by the end, end of her NCAA career, and sort of the naturals rolled around, she wanted to be done. She did for her gym fair as well, she wanted to, but now she's running competitively for a pro team and is again loving her sport because she's doing it on her own and she's doing it without that. You, you have a scholarship, you need to do certain things. So. Again, it's just you need to do it because you love it, not because you have to do it. And if you're doing it because you have to do it, it's time to get out. Coach, kids who feel that way when they're 11 years old, when they feel like they, they have no choice, they have to get out. They're 11, they're in sixth grade. We lost a couple of kids to our travel team. Your parents, you've got to play on a better team. And the kids are in tears. He goes, our team's fun. We sing, but we're fun. <laughs> we have a lot of fun. We have a party. We go to five guys after the games. <laughs> and, and the parents take the kids and they say, you've got to play in a premier team. Because you've got to get a college scholarship. Kids are in sixth grade. They haven't even taken their PSSAs yet. And they're already being, being groomed for college. And I see it younger and younger. It's quicker and quicker. I don't know if you guys, if you work with kids or at all, these younger kids, but it's, it's happening early and early. It's a shame. Get extra credit tonight. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that means there's a lot of ball teams <laughs> um, Do you feel like ballet dancing or gymnastics, um, do they make other kinds of swing sports the types of things that you see later on in the case of um, this, this stretching or the strength training that we, that we tend to see when we get to the center? Unfortunately, none of my athletes are ballerinas. <laughs> <laughs> drastically different. Um, right now, the big trend that people are researching is flexibility. Does it harm or does it help our athletes? That I just participated in a study last basketball season where she was evaluating flexible athletes versus non-flexible athletes and their brain injury. So that, that's a topic that I'm not, I don't want to give either way because we're still kind of divulging into it. But again, any time that you can train different musculature. So if I had an athlete that played basketball and did ballet on the side, that would be wonderful. I make a big push for a body to be balanced. So if I can get my basketball team to go to yoga, oh my goodness, it's, it's life changing for them. Because now their body is going to be balanced. So if you can do anything that's totally different on different ends of the spectrum, then yes, I think that that would benefit I was going to say, I did ballet before I started playing sports, and it helped me so much. I like always was slightly more aware of what my body was doing than I was my teammates, especially when we were like younger and like junior high. Like, I knew what my body was doing because I've had to from ballet, and they like had no idea. So, yeah. And that's a great point because one of the biggest things for me, so I, I, I harp on my athletes and I, I teach them this, but they have to understand how their own body is moving. So anytime we have them do something ballet oriented or yoga oriented, so they understand my body's moving this way and that's not correct, it's an immense benefit for the athlete. So thank you, that's a great point. Speaking of totally ballet? Um, no. <laughs> Why not? I don't have time. <laughs> I, and the point two is where it's going to happen. <laughs> I, saw, I saw Pilates help with some swimmers. Mm -hmm. Yes, now it's correct and feel how that feels. That mind body awareness is huge. 